we are streaming live on Facebook, just to let everybody know that. So if you don't want to be seen live on Facebook, you might want to turn your video off. We'll do a few more housekeeping in a minute where everybody's here. Okay, we're just going to wait 30 more seconds before we kick off. So hope everyone, if everyone wants to grab a glass of water, whatever it is they need before we begin, please go for it. I still haven't quite figured out that you can't look at someone on the screen and wave to them and have them know that you're waving to them. <laughs> and it's been a while, so I think that one's just not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> It's true, I always want to name everyone by name and then you feel like you can't do that either. It's, it still takes getting used to, doesn't it? Okay, we're going to begin. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Masorti Thinks. This is the third session of Masorti Thinks, and we're really excited for so many people to be here. It's really wonderful to have you here. Um, this, for those of you who have been to other sessions, Masorti Thinks is really... Uh, an attempt to think about some of the issues which are really, really important to the Masorti community and grapple with perhaps how Masorti might approach some of those issues. So today we're going to be looking at a really important topic um, in, in basically racism and diversity and how we think about that. Um, I'd like to really thank Rabbi Natasha Mann, of Hems Mosaic Masorti Community and New London, um, as well as Rabbi Zagoria Moffitt of St Albans Masorti Synagogue for being brave enough to take up the challenge to facilitate this session. Really, really thankful to you both for being here and, and learning with us and teaching us. Um, just a very few uh, comments about housekeeping today. Um, obviously, this is a really important subject. It's also a really sensitive subject. And because of that, we've put a few different things in. Um, first of all, you might have noticed um, everybody is muted today, just to make sure that we really making sure that this is a safe, a safe space for everybody to hear and to think. We are allowing comments directly to us, to myself, Rachel, and you'll see next to me, it says questions and comments. As we go through, if there are any questions or comments, whether they're clarifying comments, please feel free to write me a message and I will ask those questions. Later on in the session, after the core piece of, uh, core piece of teaching, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. So if you do have a question, please send it to me and we'll see how many we're able to get through. Um, I think that's it. So I will pass you over to Rabbi Adam, um, who I think will be kicking us off. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And um, just to say before we start, um, it's, it's, I feel a bit of a bait and switch, perhaps the name of the session and what we're going to be looking at today, but it's a purposeful one, which is that um, both Rabbi Natasha and myself when talking about this felt that it wasn't really fair or proper for us to be talking about the experience of Jews of color or of people of color predominantly in our discussion in terms of contemporary policy and um, because we want to put those voices center stage in that conversation. So since you have two rabbis center stage today and that's our primary identity at least for the moment we're going to be talking about Torah today predominantly but our aim is that by looking at two particular examples of how racialism is seen in Jewish sources, we can get a grasp of how we can address racism in our own community and in the world today. So it might be a bit indirect, but hopefully if you stick with us and if you engage in the discussion at the end, we'll get some good advice maybe on what we can do and actions we can take to try and address some of these issues in our community and without it. So as a, as a introduction, 
I am reminded of an article now from a couple of years ago in the, um, the Times of Israel, a long form piece about the new policy of the Rabbanut conversion program in Israel and the Rabbanut courts to suggest or require in some cases a genetic DNA test to verify someone's Jewishness. And this piece, which I definitely recommend if you have the time to read it, looked at all these different voices in the conversation, some supportive saying that it made it more accessible for people who couldn't prove their Jewish identity otherwise, and some very critical. And so critical, in fact, they said, this makes us a bit like the Nazis, worrying about who's full Jewish, who's half Jewish, who's a quarter Jewish. And there's a lot of uncomfortability with that. And I think there probably should be, although it's an interesting and different argument to make about whether or not you can be Jewish via DNA. But what it tells us is that clearly the discussion around Jewishness and race is actually quite a live one. And by looking at what Jewishness means in a racial context, we can understand better, hopefully, how we can address the questions of race outside of the Jewish sphere as well. So the fact that the Rabbanut feels like they can establish someone's Jewishness on the basis of their blood actually has a long history and a long complex development that goes all the way back to the prophet Zephania, who Rabbi Natasha is going to teach us a little bit about, and into the Middle Ages when we see a very different take on what Jewish identity is via race, and ultimately up until our own period today. And looking at that history, two small pieces of a much larger history, we hope that we'll get a better sense of what that conversation about Jewishness and insider outsider and ultimately Jewish as race can teach us. So Rabbi Tosh is going to start and share some sources with us from the prophet Zephania, not one of the better known ones, but I think Natasha would like that to change. Yes, I've been um, recently, some of you might know, um, I've had my head very much in the in the minor prophets, um, these books that we don't tend to spend much time in. And the book of Zephania really spoke to me. And when uh, Rabbi Adam and I were discussing where we wanted to go with this topic, it felt very much to me like um, the obvious place to start, which maybe wouldn't be obvious to everyone. Um, so I'm going to start us out. I'm going to share some texts. I just first want to add something quick to what Rabbi Adam was saying. Thank you for for introducing this. Um, I think there's something you know um, that's come out recently as we've been talking more about the way in which we think about race in our society and the way in which it plays out. That is about how things are or are not baked into the fabric of the society. That was a very mixed metaphor, but I think you understood what I meant. Um, and I think this is, um, you know, we as Jews are a part of a wider society. And so naturally we are affected by that. And I think one of the interesting things about trying to look back at the history of our own development when it comes to this is like, what ways in which, um, what are the ways in which our texts and our tradition and our culture um, lead us into those places and what are the ways in which they might lead us out of those places. So I'm really excited to um, to share these particular texts with you. I'm going to share my screen now so that you can see them along with us. Um, so the book of Stefania, it's not a well-known um, uh, prophet. He is the last of the pre-exile prophets. Um, if that means something to you, that's wonderful. If not, don't worry too much about it. Um, and the, the interesting thing about Zephania for, um, for our purposes is that Zephania is almost definitely um, a Jew of color. They wouldn't have had that kind of language back then. And in fact, that's part of what I think is really interesting about this. But the way in which he gets described in, in his introduction um, should lead us immediately to the place in which we actually know a little bit more about what Zephania looks like than we might know about any other um, minor prophets or any other prophets even as they come up in the text and that's because the introduction to Tzvania is little um, they don't all have this but most of them have like a tiny little verse at the beginning that just kind of tells us you know they came from this village and this this was the king at the time. Tzvania tells us something a little bit interesting in that we get uh, Devar Hashem we get the word of God that came to Tzvania and then we get the rest of his name. Now, I'm going to take you just to the English that you can see. We have son of Kushi. This is the, the thing that's going to be interesting to us. But we also have son of Gedalia, son of Amaria, son of Hezekiah. That's like four different sons of that we get at the beginning here. 
in most books, we're lucky if we get one son of. We're lucky if we know what the prophet's father's name was. For some reason, the person who penned this, so it's not really with a pen, um, wanted us to know that, uh, wanted us to know all the way back to Hezekiah. I'm gonna start there because Hezekiah might actually be a name that is um, familiar to some people. Hezekiah was the name of a king. Um, and if we've got multiple generations leading us back to a name like Hezekiah, we can probably assume that the Hezekiah in question is an important person. Otherwise, why did you bring us back this far and why did you stop there? And the important Hezekiah that we know of is King Hezekiah, who's one of the good kings of Judah. Um, also interesting that Sophania is prophesying during the reign of King Josiah, who's also one of the good reforming kings. So we kind of, um, we start out by going, oh, this is Stephania. He's like the great grandchild of King Hezekiah. We're in a, he's got pretty good lineage there. Um, but we also have this really strange note here that Stephania is Ben Cushi, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, et cetera. Um, it is possible that his father's name is Cushi, but that would be a very, very strange name indeed, because when we call someone, uh, when they called someone Kushi, what they meant was that they came from around Ethiopia. It's the name of a certain place. It would be like calling them, uh, you know, son of Israelite, son of Ethiopian, something like that. So we can guess from this that son of Kushi either is an explanation that uh, Sophania's heritage is also rooted in Ethiopia, maybe through his mother or through his gra or one of his grandparents, um, or his father was actually named Kushi, in which case a very strange name and probably a name that would be given to, uh, to someone because they themselves were um, the descendant of an Ethiopian. So the reason that I think this is so interesting, just as a beginning of this text, is that we know two things about Sfania before we begin. We often don't know anything about the prophet before we begin. We know that he has some heritage that is rooted deep in Africa, and we know that he has some heritage that is rooted in the royal line of Judah. Um, for Sophania in general, um, we don't need to spend too much time in the text, but I do want to show you that it is really, I think, relevant to the way in which Sophania um, brings prophecy to the Israelites, because Sophania's prophecies tend to be about Israel and about not Israel. Um, Sophania starts off with a series of prophecies against the, the other tribes around them. We get against Moab, et cetera. Um, I'm not gonna take you through all of this because I think, I think it's really interesting, but it's also not completely on topic. Um, you'll see as part of it that he also talks about the Kushites. The Kushites actually come up more than once in Sephania, which again tells us that there's something interesting about the fact that we have that to begin with. Um, and then we have just, I think, the most beautiful, um, I'm going to use the term bait and switch because uh, Rabbi Adam used it earlier. We have this really incredible bait and switch in the book of Savannah, in which he's talking about all of these other places, talks about the destruction of Assyria, who's the big bad from the previous generations, and about making Nineveh a desolation, and then continues to talk about Nineveh beautiful, awful language. In it, flocks shall lie down, every species of beast, while jackdaws and owls roost on its capitals, the great owl hoots in the window, and the raven croaks on the threshold, for he has stripped its cedar work bare. Is this the jubilant city that dwelt secure, that thought in her heart, I am and there is none but me? Alas, she has become a waste, a lair of wild beasts, Everyone who passes by her hisses and gestures with his hand. That is the end of chapter two. Chapter three begins with a sullied, polluted, overbearing city who's become disobedient and continues and continues along that line until eventually we realize um, that Sophania is no longer talking about Nineveh. Sophania is actually talking about Jerusalem, 
it's really um, quite shocking and awful, and I must imagine for Stefania's audience that bait and switch was probably very emotional. The realization that all of those things that we were cheering for when we thought it was against Nineveh, um, it's actually been turned on its head and is and is about Jerusalem instead. Um, Stefania's uh, Stefania's heritage is important here, I think, because Stefania is. Um, is bringing that with him in the way in which he, he he offers prophecy. There's something about the experience of belonging to this tribe and the experience of having heritage that is rooted in another tribe, which I think gives Sophania a particular flavor. And um, you know, I also um, I'm I'm a mixed race individual. I'm I'm half white and I'm half Indian, and so Sophania has always been you know, since I realized this being one of my favorites for that, for the sense of sort of having this heritage from multiple places and realizing that that makes a difference in the way in which I don't prophesy, but the way in which you teach. Um, so Stefania's um, heritage, the part of the reason I wanted to bring this in this conversation about like, what is the structure that we're talking about when we talk about what now we might call race. Stefania's heritage is important because it offers some kind of difference in the way in which he sees the world, but it doesn't seem to make a difference to whether or not he's an Israelite. And in fact, he's not the only person described as a Kushite who's, um, who's just unquestionably also an Israelite. The other famous person who is a Kushite is Moses' wife. Like when you go back to that, uh, that group of people who leave Egypt and end up at Sinai, we have this sort of ragtag group of people from different places. It's not as simple as what Rabbi Adam was talking about with the sort of purity test of your DNA. I'm going to come out of the share now so I can see your faces instead. Um, that kind of that kind of idea that we can test your purity in being an Israelite via obviously they didn't know about DNA, but even via um, via heritage doesn't exist. It doesn't matter that Sophania also has his heritage rooted in another tribe because he's an Israelite. Like he can be a prophet, he can be the descendant of a king. It doesn't really the, the only way in which it matters is that it gives him a different perspective on something that he can then bring to his prophecy. And that's because that whole concept of, um, of DNA based, blood based race doesn't exist yet. What exists is tribalism. What exists is, are you a part of this tribe or are you a part of that tribe? And Stefania might have heritage that is based in a different tribe, but so does King David. It doesn't seem to matter at that point. What matters is, are you inside the tent or are you outside the tent? Um, tribe is more like a big family. I know that when we think about, about tribe, sometimes we don't use it in a way that is positive, but I think that it's quite neutral in the way in which it's working here. It's like, are you a part of my extended family and therefore a part of my extended trusted group? Or are you from outside and therefore you don't necessarily have the same rules that we have? Um, you don't necessarily abide by the same laws that we have. You don't necessarily worship the same God that we worship. That's the sort of line which is dividing people rather than where are your ancestors from, rather than um, what do you look like? Um, what we're interested in is, are you a part of the family or are you not part of the family? Um, that's the sort of biblical model. Now, obviously we don't stay there. And part of the reason that we don't stay there is that the world doesn't stay there. We no longer live in a world that thinks in those kinds of broad village tribalistic um, ways. And so we end up thinking of the question of who is or is not a Jew, who is or is not part of whatever it means to be an Israelite differently based largely, I think, on the way in which the world is thinking about it differently. And I think Rabbi Adam is now going to bring us forward a few centuries to explore that. Yes, indeed. More like a few millennia, I think, indeed. <laughs> um, so absolutely right. I think that we see the example, as Zavanya illustrates so well, that in the Tanakh, what it means to be in the tribe is an opt-in, multi-ethnic, quite diverse identity. Not, not unflaggingly, but certainly what a great example in Zavanya. But as you said, Robert Natasha, that changes. 
and change is exactly right because people change. And as one of my favorite teachers at, uh, at JTS used to say, Jews are people too. And Jews do things that people do. And the big change happens in the medieval period. And the background to this is partially also the thing that maybe we can say is responsible for basically all conceptions of biological race today. There is a, a theory or a hypothesis perhaps that actually you can trace most of what is today biological race theory and the implications of it for racism all the way back to the Spanish Inquisition and to the very early days of the Spanish Inquisition. Because the Spanish Inquisition was faced with a dilemma, which was how could they actually identify what was different about the Jews who converted to Christianity? If they converted to Christianity, then they were Christians, theoretically, because they also, up until that moment, had a sense of tribe based on opt-in. But clearly not everyone felt that way, because they started to introduce a new idea to the system, an idea that made it possible to actually hunt down the Jews who were insufficiently Christian in a way that actually introduced what we might call race, which is an idea that they call in Spanish limpieza de sangre, which is the blood purity, literally cleanliness of blood. And this notion was articulated first by the Spanish Inquisition, specifically to find Jews, and specifically to identify what was different about Jews from what was different about real Spaniards. And it introduced the idea that the Jews who had converted to Christianity, however willingly they did so, were not real Spaniards, even two or three or four generations on. Because by 1492, most of them had converted several generations already, and yet it was still not enough still not enough and they required them to be either forcibly converted again, killed or to leave, as we know. And in the background of all of this kind of 13th, 14th, 15th century Spanish culture, there's also something else that happens in Jewish life, which is the flourishing of mysticism and a particular type of mysticism, what we might call the contemplative Kabbalah and its main work, which is the Zohar. The Zohar is a very complicated book. It's actually not a book. It's really more of an anthology. The Zohar introduces or emphasizes many ideas in Judaism that the rabbis had stated earlier, but actually weren't very important. And it also introduces some new ideas to Judaism that really weren't very present before. One of those new ideas introduces is the notion, sometimes maybe a translation of blood purity, that actually there's something different, ontologically, essentially, biologically, or metaphysically different about Jews versus their non-Jewish neighbors. The accusation used against Jews that they were somehow different in an essential way from the Christians around them gets flipped on its head by Jewish sources in a way that I think is very dangerous. And we're going to look at that trajectory. So what I want to explore, and I've got some sources here as well, of course, rabbis, really sorry, is this trajectory of Jewish sources, starting with the Zohar and continuing through to the modern day, which articulate a notion that more or less I would call metaphysical racism. Right, because the notion is that Jewish souls are different from non-Jewish souls. Our rabbis put it in terms of soul, but if you switch the word soul for blood, it would be exactly the same rhetoric as the Spanish priests who were leaving the Inquisition were using. And I think we can see it as a way of them responding to that. So I just wanna kind of survey some of these sources and um, I'm gonna read the Zohar text here first. This isn't the only one, but it's one of them. And then take a look at how this gets applied in some later sources. So Zohar, once again, 13th century Spain, in the midst of the Inquisition, the very early stages of it, in the midst of struggling with what it means to be Jewish or Christian or one or the other, in or out, as we talked about. So Rabbi Abba in the Zohar comments on Nefesh Chaya, right, a living being that comes all the way from the very beginning of Genesis. This is the very beginning of the Zohar. Soul of the living being, namely Israel, for they are the signs of the Blessed Holy One and their holy souls derive from him. The soul of other nations, whence does it come from? Rabbi Elazar says, and he quotes once again from Genesis, let the earth bring forth nefesh chaya, living beings, according to their kind. This is all the other creatures, each according to its kind. And Rabbi Elazar added, this supports what we have said, nefesh chaya, souls of the living being, which are Israel, who are the souls of the supernal, holy, living being. And then the rest of the verse, cattle, crawling things, and living creatures of the earth, those are the other nations who are not souls of the living being, but rather foreskin, as we have said. Obviously a strange interpretation. It's a typically rabbinic one to take a verse, to look at the meaning of a word, to deduce what the meaning is, then to make assumptions about the rest of the verse on that basis. 
right? If we say nefesh chaya means it talks about Jewish souls, and then we say the rest of the verse talking about cattle and insects and other beasts is talking about non-Jewish souls, then what we're clearly setting up is the idea that there's something ontologically different about Jewish souls, and actually not too far away from the idea that maybe the non-Jews don't even have souls in a meaningful way, which is ultimately where we're going in some way. And by the way, and hopefully the disclaimer is clear, I, I and hopefully you are not endorsing this idea. But <laughs> what we're interested in is, is in seeing this idea, understanding this is part of our Jewish history, our ideological development, and hopefully it all makes us really uncomfortable. But that doesn't mean we can ignore it because the Zohar is not a marginal text. Even if you're not a Kabbalist, or if your Kabbalist doesn't like the Zohar, that's me, the Zohar is not a marginal text. It's worth studying. It's really important because it's had a huge influence on Jewish sources. One of those influences is that Kabbalah goes mainstream, not at the time of the Zohar, but a couple hundred years later, in the moment in the mid 16th century in Sfat, when you have some of those exiles from Spain, some of the people who lost their homes and their livelihoods and their lives and their families moving to the land of Israel in Ottoman Palestine and settling in the city of Sfat and having there an explosion of mystical ideas and energy, which drew on the Zohar and expanded it further. And one of those was Chaim Vital, who is primarily known for teaching what his teacher, Isaac Luria, had to say, although Isaac Luria actually wrote nothing, so we're reliant on Chaim Vital to tell us what Isaac Luria said, which is always eh, a little bit dodgy. And he introduces another notion. Now, this notion, probably if you've spent any time among certain mystically inclined Jewish communities today, including Chabad, Aish, might be familiar to you. The idea that there are three levels of the soul. Here's what he says exactly from Eitz Chaim, his main compendium. So we find that Israel possesses the three levels of the soul, nefesh, ruach, and neshama, from holiness. The Gentiles, however, possess only the level of nefesh, from the feminine side of the klipot. For the souls of the nations who come from the klipot are evil and not good. So you, you don't need to worry about what the klipot are, what he's talking about, no one knows. But the idea is that actually there's three levels of the soul, one, two, three. We Jews have all three, whereas everyone else has only the first level. And the first level, by the way, the nefesh level is associated with animals. Animals also only have a nefesh. Things, people which have um, emotional capabilities but not intellectual ones have nefesh and ruach, Jews obviously. And people who have attained neshama are the ones who really have the insight and intellectual, but that's clearly only open, according to him, to Jews because the possibility of having all three parts of the soul is only present for some. So once again, he's putting the level of non-Jewish souls on the same level as animals and suggesting it comes from an evil place as opposed to our souls, which come from a good place. Hopefully this makes us all squirm, all right? It makes me squirm, but it's only getting worse. Good news. The Zohar is gonna seem mild by the time we get to the end. This is Ramchal. This is the next big step in the influence of Kabbalah on Jewish history. Ramchal, for those who don't know, is Moshe Chaim Buzato. He's an Italian rabbi. He's the first modern rabbi in many ways. He writes poetry, he writes plays. He's a modern in many ways, and he's hugely influential, even if you've never heard of him, on the development of Ashkenazi Judaism, even though he's Italian, because his interpretation of Kabbalah becomes very, very important. Now, he writes a kind of guide to Jewish belief, the, one of the first books, proper books of Jewish theology, called Derech Hashem. And uh, this is one of the things he says in there. Just gonna kind of survey a few bits of this here. Um, so he, he introduces the idea that non-Jews actually are human. Good news, non-Jews are human. And then he says this, however, since they do have an aspect of humanity, even though it's lowly, the Holy Blessed One wanted that they would have what is similar to true humanity. That's us, by the way. And that means they do have a soul, similar to the souls of the children of Israel, even though its level is much lower than the level of the souls of Israel, and that they have commandments through which they can acquire physical and spiritual success according to that which is appropriate for their condition. And these are the Noahide laws, right? Those are seven laws given to Noah. So we have 613 commandments for our elevated souls. They have seven for their sad, poor souls. It's very patronizing, this text, right? Oh, they do have souls, but they're so, so rubbish souls. They're not really much better than the previous ones. And he goes even further to imagine what happens after death in, in Olam Haba, the world to come. Nations other than Israel, besides Israel, will not be found at all in the world to come. They have no future in the world to come. Existence will be given to the pious of the nations of the world. That's chasidei umot alam, common rabbinic phrase by way of being an addition and appendage of Israel itself. And they will be secondary to them, like clothing is secondary to a person. <sighs> this is horrible. Now, hopefully, if you spent any time with rabbinic literature, you also know this is wrong. 
right? One of the things that distinguishes Judaism, original Judaism, fundamental Judaism from Chazal, is that we don't believe that we're the only ones who have an afterlife. We don't have an exclusivistic claim on what happens after we die. We think anyone who's righteous, who follows the seven laws of Noah, will have the same afterlife we do. We are actually not seeing ourselves as special. There's many rabbinic statements exactly to the opposite of this. And yet, here we have what I think is ultimately a very Christian idea, that we'll be the ones saved, we'll have an afterlife, and there might be some, you know, scattered other people who are really good, but they're only going to be there because of us. They're just hanging, hanging on. They're just glomming onto our righteousness. And that's ultimately, in some ways, much worse than what we've seen in the prior sources, because what we're seeing is that this idea that non-Jews souls are different than ours is getting articulated and developed in a way that shows it's not marginal and it's not something we can ignore. Right, two more. Now, those who have studied with me before will know that I hate Hasidut. Um, I can say more about why I hate Hasidut differently, but this is partially why. Um, Hasidut takes all of the notions of Kabbalah, um, the good ones and the bad ones, and makes them very mm, exaggerated, let's say. And here we see that happening with this notion of non-Jews having different souls. This is Sadok HaKohen of Lubdan, um, one of the fairly early Hasidic rabbis. Um, and this is in his book, Preed Sadiq. And uh, it's pretty bleak. Before the giving of the Torah, the souls of the nations, that's everyone else, and of Israel were all at one level for good and evil and the filth of the snake were all combined. When Israel received the Torah and were chosen to be a special nation, the filth ceased to exist in them. And consequently, the roots of their souls were separated from those of the Gentiles. And all the good was rooted and set aside for the souls of Israel and all the evil found root in the souls of the other nations for they are all part of the evil and of Satan's camp. Once again, by the way, Satan doesn't have a camp in Jewish sources. This is a Christian influence, again, seeing the devil as an actor who has minions, and those minions are the non-Jews. Very, very problematic. Problematic is an understatement. But it does go to show that, once again, this idea clearly needed more explanation. People were asking him, well, how did it come about then that we have souls and they don't, that we have good souls and they have evil souls? He had to come up with an etiology, a backstory for how it is that our souls diverged and ours are good and theirs are bad. And he gives us that by virtue of us receiving the Torah. And after that, everyone else literally goes to hell in a handbasket and becomes Satan's army. It's only getting more and more developed, the idea and different angles. And you can see that this wasn't something people were just easy to disregard. It clearly was something that people believed in very deeply. And many, by the way, still do, which is what we're gonna come into ultimately. The last one, speaking of still do, is Rav Cook, who I also hate, by the way. I have no problem saying that I don't like Rav Cook for a variety of reasons. And one of them is stuff like this. This is the culmination of this entire tradition, a thousand years almost on from the Zohar. Rav Cook has to say this, in the 20th century, the difference between the Jewish soul and all its independence, inner desires, longings, character, and standing, and the soul of all the Gentiles and all their levels is greater and deeper than the difference between the soul of a human being and the soul of an animal. For the difference in the latter case is one of quantity, while the difference in the first case is one of essential quality. Yikes, right, yikes. This is not just saying that, well, their souls are not as developed as ours. Ours are a bit more developed, right? There's a pretentiousness to the earlier sources. This is saying, actually, it's not just about us having more soul and they having less soul. It's not a matter of degree. It's a matter of essential ontological quality. And this idea is now actually very influential. Now, hopefully that makes us uncomfortable, this idea is influential. Whether or not you've ever seen a rabbi teach these sources, probably unlikely. Um, it's very, very present in many corners of our Jewish world. And it's probably not absent from our own, right? Although we like to think, and rightly so, that Masorti is the best incarnation of Judaism, that doesn't mean that we're free from many of these ideas because these ideas are part of the Jewish tradition and we have a responsibility to understand what they are and how to respond to them. Now, this development that we've seen from blood purity in the Spanish Inquisition to the chief rabbi, chief Ashkenazi rabbi of Israel, suggesting that non-Jews souls are more different to ours than animals are because of quant quality, not quantity. That's a natural progression. And it's one that if we want to be able to respond to, we have to be very careful to find a way of articulating an opposite view. Because we can't just go, oh, I think that's wrong. Because clearly that's not enough. We have to be able to articulate why that's wrong, why that contradicts previous Jewish ideas, why that contradicts what the Torah teaches us, and be able to articulate a new and maybe old viewpoint on what essentially makes someone Jewish or not Jewish. 
And we've clearly failed to do that. And the reason that I know we failed to do that is because the Rabbanut is testing people's DNA, right? The fact that the Rabbanut feels like they can understand who's Jewish and who's not by testing their DNA, although it is many times different than the theological conversation about souls, is ultimately the same phenomenon because it's identifying Jewishness as something essential about your blood, about your body, about who you are, and not, as Natasha showed us in looking at Sophania, the diverse, tribal, multi-ethnic, and actually quite tolerant view of the Tanakh. I think Rabbi Natasha was right that we tend to be very uncomfortable with tribalism. Tribe is a bad word these days. But actually, one of the benefits of tribalism, at least if it's done right, is that it allows for a great deal of tolerance. Because although we might like our tribe more than we like the other tribes, which is reasonable, we don't see the other tribes as being ontologically different from us. They just have different practices, different religions, different cultures, different languages. There's inherent tolerance in that, which is possible, even if rarely achieved, which is not possible once we adopt the view of the Zohar and all the sources that follow it, and ultimately, which is the view of Christian inquisitors in the Spanish medieval period, that there's something essential about Jewish blood or Jewish souls. And what we'd like to do is to discuss what that means. I'm curious to hear what people feel about these sources and ultimately look at what that means for us in terms of how we can act. Do we have the sources or the knowledge or the skills to articulate a view of Jewishness, which is itself a buttress against racism? Because if we do, then we can bring that outside of Jewishness and use that to address racism on the whole scale and hopefully ultimately develop a kind of anti-racist ethic by virtue of our own sources and our own tradition. And I think that we have the responsibility of trying to do that because we, can't, we have to contend with these sources in both the positive and the negative. I just wanna, I just wanna add something to that because it was really interesting um, and you know, awful, awful texts that you brought to us. And also really interesting in terms of, yeah, thanks, in terms of the, the trajectory from this tribalism to this sort of blood versus soul question is that, you know, and it's just really occurred to me now, Safania isn't talking to the other nations as if they are lesser beings. Safania, and also, by the way, pretty much all of the other prophets seem to see an inherent equality in the fact that they are willing to prophesy to and against the other nations, to say to them that what they're doing is, is you know, is ethically wrong. And that, that, you know, there is one God who is the God of all of us. This like naturally comes from a place that is completely at odds with the idea of the non-Jews are just basically animals. It's a or very non-biblical, or worse than animals, it's a completely non-biblical take by the time you get to that sort of um, Middle Ages view of what the non-Jew is. Um, which is, I, I just think it just occurred to me as you were speaking, like there's no way that any of our prophets would have prophesied the way that they did if they believed anything like what these um, Kabbalistic texts um, are bringing to us. Yeah. Um, we need to be we're... fundamentalists, clearly. I think you know, <laughs> all for Jewish fundamentalism, everyone, um, because what that would mean is going back to these often more liberal, more tolerant views that we see in the biblical period, which don't get nearly enough credit. Right, which in contrast to what we see in the medieval and modern period, actually represents something essential about Judaism and not the influence of other cultures. And to, to decolonize our minds, which is one of, I think, the most important things we can do, to take away those Christian conceptions is not easy. To look at Zephania and see it positively, as Rabbi Natasha suggested, is, is really not an easy thing for many people to do. Mm -hmm. I just want to um, I just want to take a moment to take us into the sort of questions of race about this, because I realized that for some people, it might feel that we went a little bit off the beaten track by talking about this, um, that because the question you know, that we've been looking at is more about the question of like fundamentally, what does it mean to be Jewish um, the way in which this then plays out in terms of um, in terms of racism is not just about Jews versus non-Jews. Like we see this, um, this idea of, of, of blood purity and this idea of soul purity play out in all kinds of ways that end up being you know, fundamentally racist. Um, you know, many of those stories that we can look to in the modern state of Israel and point to and say something really racist happened here have their origins, I think, and have that sort of 
the origin of that drive from the, exactly what um, Rabbi Adam has been bringing to us. Um, and I also want to, you know, maybe be a little bit kinder to <laughs> than, than Rabbi Adam is being to, um, to Christianity, because I don't think it's as simple as Christianity brought racism to Judaism. And I want to make sure that we're not thinking in those ways. You know, Jews who are racist, by and large, are racist for the same reasons that non-Jews are racist. That we These are, are born... Too. Yeah, Jews are people too. We are born into and raised in a society that has all kinds of racism baked into its core. The question is like, what are the way, the question that's interesting to me in terms of Torah is what are the ways in which we're set up to succeed and the ways in which we're set up to fail when it comes to, uh, to turning against that kind of racism. And we are, I think, because of exactly what Rabbi Adam brought in a way set up to fail. Um, because we've been, we've had baked into our tradition these ideas of purity that are ultimately colonization of Christianity on Judaism, but it's a few more steps than just like Christianity brought racism to us. It's more that um, the question of who is and is not a Jew, the way in which that plays out in, on a sort of ontological um, playing field, um, sets us up to uh, to be better or worse anti-racists um, and actually you know what what I would suggest we need to do on the question of who is a Jew is really unpeel all of that um, and recognize that we're not talking about questions of blood and we're not talking about questions of soul and that's and I recognize that's really hard partly because um, it seems in my experience that people are either interested in talking about Jewishness in terms of soul or interested in talking about Jewishness in terms of blood those of us who are religious and believe in that converts are equally as Jewish as born Jews are very interested in talking about the Jewish soul. People who are born Jewish and are not religious but are 100% Jewish because mum was Jewish are very interested in talking about blood and not very interested in talking about soul. And actually both of those are very problematic ways in which to talk about um, what makes a Jew a Jew. What makes a Jew a Jew is being a part of a tribe. Um, and that comes down to all kinds of things about culture and about language and about food. It is just not as simple as um, us having different genes or us having different souls to anyone else. And so I think, you know, if, if I want anyone to take anything away from this, it's that um, that kind of language is ultimately not helping us be better anti-racist making the assumption that we all want to be better anti-racists, which I hope is true. Okay, um, so we've got a few comments and questions. Um, perhaps I'm going to come to the people and um, ask you to, um, well, actually, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Um, Ed, Tiga, do you want to um, ask your question? Martin might need to help. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, concerned about the what, it, what seems must be a political um, aspect of this, if the important Hasidic parties in Israel, who have who are generally part of the coalition of government because of pro pro proportional representation, if they do not accept um, Arabs or Muslims as having a, de having a proper soul, that would uh, have a great influence on Israeli politics. It has. And uh, this would be uh, similar to the, uh, paradoxically, the attitude of Trump towards Israel being influenced by the um, Christian evangelists who want to promote the growth of Israel for uh, like racist reasons rather than for human rights. Yeah, Edward, I think you're, um, I, I, I'm, I'm enjoying my week of not saying or talking about Trump. So I'm going to leave Trump to the side if that's okay. Um, I think we all deserve a week off. Um, but I, I will say, I think you're absolutely right about the, the impact of this idea. I think ideas are very powerful. I think we all should. And they're powerful in how they're applied. There's a famous book, unfortunately famous for the wrong reasons, I think called Torah Melech. It's written by a settler rabbi about 20 years ago, which is very hard to find, but it's circulated in certain Haredi and, and, and religious Zionist modern Orthodox circles in Israel quite frequently, which explicitly says, here's all the sources, 
that show you that that the non-Jews don't have souls. They're they're less significant than animals. Go ahead and kill them. Like don't feel bad about killing them. This is a rabbinic uh, permit to kill on the basis of exactly the idea we see here. So it is quite real and dangerous. It's not just a theoretical exercise. It has resulted in death and it will continue to until we can find another way to address it and to say this isn't actually authentic Judaism, as is often the case with a lot of Haredi ideas, which actually are often not biblical in origin or even medieval, but often very modern. Our best response is to go, hang on a second, what about what the Tanakh says? What about what the rabbis said? What about Chazal? If we speak from the sources and go, that's not what the rabbis said, we have a much more authoritative position to respond to that. And that's why we have to understand these sources in order to rebut them. So absolutely, we need voices in Israel and around the world who are willing to suggest and articulate and develop a Jewish ethic of soul, which is different than the one that's, that's predominated maybe one more like what we see in the rabbinic sources which don't see much importance to a soul they don't even have much language for a soul what they care about is what people do and whether they're moral and that's a much more um inclusive category ultimately because it doesn't matter who you are it matters what you do and that's ultimately what we need to try and reaffirm i think if we're going to have any luck in responding probably to trump but especially to that sort of rabbinic idea that's very common in israel today yeah, I don't have a lot to add to that. I'm very much behind what Rabbi Adam just said, but I, you know, I think it's also helpful to understand that these things are not coming from nowhere. Mm. That, you know, I know of a few rabbis who've made statements like that. I was trying to figure out which one you were talking about there. Um, and it's easy to just say, oh, well, they're, you know, they're nut jobs. Um, but actually, they're not getting these ideas from nowhere. And if we don't understand where they're developing these ideas from, it's much harder for us to stand up and say exactly what um, what Rabbi Adam was just saying, that um, that actually you've got it wrong, that this is not a good source and it's not based in Chazal, it's not based in Tanakh. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, Georgia Kaufman, you had a comment that I thought was important. Can we, I'm just going to unmute you if you, if I can. Can we, un there you go. Morning all. Um, I've long been transfixed by the story in the Bible of um, Miriam being struck down by leprosy when she accuses Moses of having married a Cushite. And I always thought the divine response to that was pretty categorical about how we should treat racism in any form. Um, so I'm a fundamentalist. Um, but I'm much more, I'm kind of much more concerned with, with the issue, the notions of blood. Um, I'm very struck, I converted, so I'm half Jewish, my father, but I, when I converted and I was taken to the mikvah, the rabbis shouted through the door while I was actually in the mikvah that I shouldn't say the bracha that I had been told to say when I had my first dunking, but I had to say a different br bracha. And I said, well, why is that? And they explained that it was because I was half Jewish, I didn't have to have the same bracha as, as all the other converts, which was ridiculous because, you know, if it's about entering into a tribe of faith, then the blood doesn't matter. And I thought this, it's, it's always perplexed me and worried me that, that, that I was treated differently. And there was one other woman who was half Jewish as well from the, the paternal line. And the same thing happened to her. Um, and everyone else had exactly the same. Um, they all said the other bracha. I don't even know what bracha I said because he just sort of whispered it through the door and I had to repeat it. And my Hebrew wasn't good enough to understand. But it's always perplexed me because it's, it, it, what that tells me is that blood and race matters, whereas it shouldn't. It should be about a community of faith, but but un, and, I, and as an anthropologist, what's very very clear to me is that Judaism is racist, but it's also obsessed with race about itself. Um, the fact that we went from being a patriarchal society or patrilineal society to matrilineal just so that we could know who who our fathers were, who our genitors were, says we we we're kind of obsessed with race. Now I'll just throw that out. 
Um, thank you for sharing that, Georgia. I also don't know what it is that they would have had you say differently in the mikveh based on that. Um, I think there's something really interesting about the, um, you know, I didn't bring up the halachic question earlier. I thought about it, about the, the who is a Jew being through the mother rather than through the father. Um, you know, I have a slightly different take on it than just um, are we sure who the parent is? Um, I'm actually not convinced that the, you know, the origins, when you look at the texts, are really just about, do we know who gave birth to whom? Um, I think it, there's also an element there of what happens when you have someone from one tribe and someone from another tribe um, get together. And, you know, in a patriarchal society, um, you know, what happens when there, when, you know, there's some kind of affair and a baby is a result of that affair um, is the, probably that baby goes with mum rather than baby goes with dad. It's sort of my inclination of where it comes from as someone who sees this all as being very rooted in, in tribalism. And um, nonetheless, I, you know, there's something really interesting here about the question of what happens when someone is partially in and partially out, that it's actually not as simple. And I think, by the way, not as simple even in our biblical texts about um, you know, that sort of gray area. There is a gray area of, um, of not quite in and not quite out that gets constantly played out in terms of law with, for example, the stranger who resides around, um, among you. The stranger who resides among you and also worships our God, but has like not technically become one of us is this, um, this strange halachic area that we don't really play with very much anymore. Um, I think that in terms of like how we deal with converts, it can be to me, to my eye, as someone who does a lot of work with conversion students, I think it's totally different when I'm talking with someone whose father was Jewish, mother was not Jewish, but was raised in a Jewish household and was raised, you know, they know how to say the bracha over Friday night candles and they know the difference between that and the Hanukkah bracha. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not reformed. So I'm not willing to say because you were raised with a sense of Jewishness, your Jewish end of story. But I am willing to say that is a different scenario than someone who comes from no Jewish background, coming from completely the outside to the inside. You're coming from a gray area into the inside. So I have a little bit of sympathy um, with you know the, a difference in dealing with that. But once we turn that difference into being about blood rather than being about culture and ethnicity and language and food and all of those things I was talking about earlier, that's when we fall into um, into the into the issue that ends with us giving people DNA tests. And uh, can I just add? I think um, Georgia, listening to your very very helpful and interesting comment. Um, the language, half Jewish, what does that mean, right? Like ultimately for the rabbis, there's no such thing as half Jewish, there's Jewish or not Jewish. And um, the fact that we use that language, and I'm not, not suggesting that you're wrong to, because I think it's very common for us to use that language, shows that we have been thinking about it, consciously or not, in a blood way. Because what you mean when you say you're half Jewish is that um, half of your genetic material comes from someone who is ethnically and nationally Jewish, which is itself a strange, conclusion to draw. And I, I say that all the time, by the way, I find myself saying that because my, my mother is Jewish, my father is not. Um, and I often have found myself saying, oh, well, I'm, I was half Jewish, but how can I be half Jewish? What does that mean to say that? Ultimately, if we think that Jewishness is about an opt-in nationality, an ethnicity, a tribe, which as troubling as it might be, it's still the best word, then there's not really any halfway um, I don't know if that's helpful or hurtful to our attempts to try and address race, but I think it does help us to respond to the blood purity angle and maybe also helps us in looking outside the Jewish community to talk about what it means to be in or out of any group. It's not about whether you're a full or half or a quarter. It's not about searching for that little bit of Jewish blood that remains as the Inquisition did. It, it's just about acknowledging what we choose in terms of behaviors and identities. And that's much easier for us to be diverse and inclusive about, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Georgia. Um, uh, Rabbi Joel, Rabbi Joel Levy has a question. We will try and unmute you, Joel. Run. <laughs> 
<laughs> John? Yeah. yeah, you're on. You're on. So uh, first of all, thank you, both of you. This has been just really very helpful and uh, an eye-opening. It's been great. So I, I want to set, suggest that, um, that that the that the the use of of either kind of physiological, biological definitions of Judaism or metaphysical um, definitions of Judaism through soul are are really attempts to be more inclusive and not less inclusive, and that. And that um, those rabbis who I've heard using that kind of language are, are basically saying, look, I have something in common with you, even though you, you, you don't seem to be doing Jewish like I do. I have something intangible in common with you. And uh, it's a kinship which is metaphysical or biological. And it's, not, it's the opposite of what, what you guys were suggesting in terms of exclusivity. It's like trying to include more people. And in a world like our world, where Jews aren't doing Jewish very much at all, and where they're not even they're not believing Jewish very much at all, they're, they're neither be behaving nor believing in a Jewish manner. The question of what binds us all together then becomes more complex and more difficult. And then you jump to a kind of biological or ethnic uh, uh, physiological definition, because then you can say, yeah, look, we we share something qualitative which is intangible and meaningless, but actually in a kind of metaphysical way binds us all together. And even in our communities, which define themselves in theory as being, being, born on the, being built on the basis of praxis, can't define themselves on the basis of praxis because no one's bloody doing anything. So if no one's bloody doing anything, then how do you bind together? How do you define a community in the absence of, of action? And yep. and so so that that's where that's where I've experienced that kind of language. I'd be very interested to hear what you both have to say about that. Um, I'm I'm going to start if that's okay because uh, I think you're absolutely right. In in ha you're half right. <laughs> Might not be half Jewish. You're half right, right? Which is that um, this idea, the Zohar's idea, it is obviously a response to external discrimination in some way, and it does absolutely buttress internal. Um, inclusivity, right? Because it means all Jews are bound together in a way that is strengthened. But the cost of that, the cost of saying, yes, we all have the same essential soul, we all have the same blood, is that we then make everyone else less than animals. So you're absolutely right. It does have a huge benefit if our goal is to bind all Jews together in an identity that transcends behaviorism. But the cost is that we become altogether racist. Um, in terms of how we view the rest of the world. And, and I just don't think that's a cost that we should be willing to pay um, because the benefits of it are minor, right? You're, you're absolutely right. The benefits are we can have synagogues as we do today where actually most people don't do much but they feel bound together in a community. But the cost of that is much greater ultimately in terms of what it means for our relationship with other people and how it makes us think, right? It conditions us to think in racialized ways that ultimately makes us racist, or at the very least, makes us not anti-racist. And I think rather than just say it has its benefits, we should be thinking about what is the model that allows us to bind each other together in a community that has its boundaries, which it must, it must be particular in some way, but also doesn't lead us to be racially thinking towards outside that boundary. And that's, I think, what we're trying to see in Safania is that there's an in-group, right? He is an Israelite, He's also a Kushite. He's also the son of, of the son of the son of the king. There's, a, there's a, a definition of who's in and who's out there, which isn't about behavior. It is about identity. Although obviously we assume he was pretty from because he's a prophet. Um, but ultimately that identity is able to be inclusive of his diversity and inclusive of the idea that people who are not in the tribe are not crickets, right? Like there, there's something there that we can probably develop further if we're willing to do so that maybe allows us to have best of both worlds. Maybe it's have your cake and eat it too. Maybe we have to choose. If we have to choose between strengthening our internal diversity or being externally diverse and inclusive, then we're in a really bad situation. But maybe there's a way in which we don't have to choose. What do you think, Natasha? Um, I think that was very well put there. Um, I, I was just reflecting as you were speaking, Rabbi Joel, about how um, the biblical model of religion and identity is completely, completely based on the issue of the revolution of monotheism. That monotheism is a revolution 
And that means that the Israelites also aren't sure what to do with it. It's, it's new, it's shiny, it's lovely, and it's also really, really difficult because suddenly God isn't mine anymore. God is not ours anymore. It's not that we're in this city, so we worship Marduk. God actually belongs to everyone. And what we see playing out time and time again, all throughout the, the Bible, is this sort of push and pull of what that means when it comes to the other. That now um, everyone is sort of equal because we all have the same God. Everyone is made in the image of God. God is off having adventures in other places. God isn't just interested in us. Um, that's the sort of pull, but also everything that everyone else is doing is wrong and they're all terrible. And, you know, God has this special covenant with us. And there's this push and this pull that happens throughout the Bible, which I think just continues to play out through the rest of Jewish history. It plays out in different ways because suddenly, you know, we have a whole bunch of monotheist neighbors, which is really weird. Um, and so we're, we're still playing this game of how do we push and how do we pull? And I think that ultimately um, that Rabbi Adam is right, that sometimes we pull better and then we push worse. And sometimes we push better and we pull worse. And that both ends up being how we deal with the other and how we deal with ourselves. Like there's no, you know, there isn't in my, in my head, there's no good way to deal with who is a Jew for the inside party. Um, that you know, it's not okay for that to be a good model and for the way in which we deal with the outsides to be a bad model, because that actually reflects on what we do to the inside. That if we say, you know, Judaism is all about the soul and therefore it doesn't matter that your ancestors were Kushites, what we actually end up saying is your ancestors were Kushites and that's really gross, um, but it's okay because you've got a good soul. So it doesn't actually help us with the internal. Ultimately, what we do with the external reflects back on us. So we have to use a model that's good for both. Otherwise, you know, it might be okay for Jews who look like me, but it's not gonna be okay for Jews who look like Safania. Um, which is why I think that we have to give up on the idea of defining by biology. But I also, Joel, think we have to give up on the idea of defining by practice. That has also never really been the way in which we define who is and is not Jewish. It becomes a way in which we define who is and is not a good Jew. That's true. Um, I say that in quotes, by the way, before anyone gets angry at me. Um, but it's just not any of those things. It's ethnicity in a way that is deeper than race. It's ethnicity in the way that ethnicity is really about food and about language and about, you know, the words that we call our parents and grandparents, not about the, the color of the color of the skin. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Rabbi Joel, Rabbi Atom, Rabbi Natasha, um, lots of rabbis. Um, I think we have time for what for, for, for one more question. Does that does that sound about right? Sure. Um, uh, Leone, where is Leone? Can't. Oh, there she is. Hang on, Leone, I'm going to unmute you. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Rabbi Adam and Madam, uh, Rabbi Natasha. Um, I guess I have a struggle to reconcile to kind of reconcile this idea of insider and outsider. Even if we talk about tolerating the other and respecting the other, we can envision that at some point we may come in conflict with the other, whereby our existence is dependent on their non-existence. Um, and so this idea of kind of particularism and prioritizing our community or our tribe over others at some point can come into tension with the toleration or respect of others and kind of universal ideas of humanity and looking after the stranger. And I was wondering, essentially, what do we do? Can we reconcile being part of a tribe and living in a world of humans? Um, or is it a case that, no, we will have to prioritize our own and that's okay, but we have to understand that might be, um, might result in conflict with others. So is it possible to reconcile or are we just stuck in this, this tension? Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that Rama Tasha has more insight from, from the biblical framework. But the thing I think of with this really good question, Nini, is um, 
all the relationships we have in that we see tra traced over the course of the Tanakh with other tribes. And um, sometimes they're really good, sometimes they're really bad. Um, sometimes they're positive and they help each other, sometimes they're not. But that's okay, I guess, is the sense I get. Is, so I think, I don't know if it's answered your question really, but I think we have to be comfortable saying our tribe is our focus, but without the implication of that being everyone else is non-human, right? There has to be some other version of that. So think about how we talk about Edom, right, in, in the Tanakh. Edom starts out as a, a local tribe, connected with Shechem, connected with the episode of Dina, connected with Esau, connected with all these different elements. It then kind of has a place that features into the prophets quite prominently in the south. And ultimately it gets incorporated into the much later stages of the kingdom of Israel. It, in some of the kings, right? Not always the best ones, but some of the kings in fact were from Edom itself. And you see in that, I think, a very, very tortured relationship between Israel and Edom, between Judah and Edom. That ultimately, although it's a conflict, it's not a conflict that requires the non-existence of the other um, because the other isn't seen as less than human. The other is seen as another tribe. And you, that's why that tribe can sometimes be our greatest enemy and sometimes be our kings who rule over us. And, and those two things go hand in hand. Um, now, if you look at what Edo means later, particularly in the late rabbinic, early medieval and modern context, it becomes something different. Edom becomes about demons, about this kind of horrible exaggeration of Christianity and, the, and Christendom, which is made up of non-human demonic entities with whom we can have no truce, we can have no peace. And that's the same development that we see in this broader conversation. And it's the same thing if we want to try and address it. I think if we go back, fundamentalism, you heard it here, uh, if we go back to, to the Tanakh and we look at actually what's happening there, we can have a vision of being in a tribe and being in conflict with other tribes, uh, sometimes very tense conflict, which you know ultimately doesn't result in us thinking that we need to exterminate them because they're demons. Um, and that's just real. I think ultimately is that that's that's the goal. Decency is the goal, not peace. Peace is impossible, but decency is possible if we work for it. Um, it's really interesting to me that you started that um, Rabbi Adam by saying, I'm sure that Rabbi Natasha has more to say on this than the biblical model, as I was literally pulling up another biblical text. Um, so the answer to that is no, all Bible all the time. Um, Leonie, thank you for that. That was really, that was a really helpful question. And actually, this is where it brought me to. This is Amos, who's my favourite maybe my second favorite now, Minor Prophet. Um, and it's also a text about the, the Kushites um, that uh, I'm just going to read you this text. To me, O Israelites, you are just like the Ethiopians, declares the Lord. True, I brought, e I brought Israel up from the land of Egypt, but also the Philistines from Kaftor and the Arameans from Kir. And um, this, I think, is one of the hugest um, things that Amos actually has to say. I think this quote is like, it's in my head, you know, it lives rent free in my head constantly. Um, that on a theological level, it's not that the Israelites are good and everyone else is bad. That actually, after we get the story of Passover and we get these generations of living in the promised land that was promised to our ancestors, God actually turns around to us at one point and says, you do realize that you're just like the Kushites, right? That I've been, you know, doing this stuff in other places. It's not just about me and you. And um, what I was saying to Rabbi Joel before, like this constant playing out of what does it mean to be a monotheist actually means that we're not as special as we, as we would like to think we are. That there is a, a way in which we might prioritize ourselves because we're a family the same way in which we might prioritize our grandmothers, um, even though there are other lovely little old ladies out there. Um, but that doesn't mean that on a theological level that your grandmother is more important than all of the other little old ladies out there. And that I think is the point in which Amos is trying to, is trying to, um, to beat into us at that point. Don't think that just because you have a special relationship with God, that that means everyone else doesn't have a special relationship with God. And I think if we stick with that kind of biblical model, instead of playing into this sort of very hurt medieval model, like that comes from a place of like deep hurt, this stuff, 
if we don't get swallowed up in that in that hurt and the model that comes out of it, what we actually see is that we understand that on a metaphysical level, that on a theological level, people are fundamentally equal. Um, so that's what that's what I would want to go for. And that does mean that ultimately, um, you know, people who need help who are not from our tribe are equally as worthy of help as people from our tribe. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you, Leone, and, and, and thank you for the thoughtful responses. Um, I think that now we're going to, I'm going to ask, you know, call upon both of you, Rabbi Adam and Rabbi Natasha, to sort of bring your final thoughts into frame. Um, I know there's been a few questions that haven't got to be asked, and, 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 and specifically thinking around perhaps how we think about doing more broadly our practice of anti-racism and what is it the action you mentioned action at the beginning and sort of thinking with sort of thinking a lot about what it means and how we think about it but how do we move forward and have you got any points for you know the community to think about as we you know go out of this session and in back into the community in the world so I'll, I'll hand over to you I don't know who'd like to begin or should I? Um, I'll go I think I'll let you have the last word um <sighs> I wish I knew. I'll start there. Um, I think we've gotten some hints of what to do. Um, and something actually that Robin Tasha just said that the Tanakh really gives us a model in which we can see all people as equal um, is a starting point, but obviously it's not enough. And, and the, in a vacuum, it would be enough, right? If we were, if we were in a society where everything was equal, um, then it would be really nice to go, look, our text says the same thing. But the reality is we're in a society in which that's not the case. Our own internal society, as we've demonstrated, I think, the Jewish society doesn't think that's the case. It's Im embedded, as Natasha said many times, baked in. Um, I, I think it might be time to bake some bread, by the way. Um, baked in right, into our society, and it's baked into the other society. And that means it's not enough just to go, yeah, well, the Tanakh says everyone's equal. We have to go further than that. And from my point of view, uh, I'm, I think actually in some way ideas matter more than actions. I know that's not usually the, the way in which that aphorism gets told, but the ideas inform the actions. And to me, unless we can actually go out and kind of do war against these ideas, unless we can say, this is why that's wrong from the tradition, we're never gonna succeed in addressing our own internal racism or in making Judaism a force for anti-racism more broadly. And there's, there's two components of that which are essential some of which we do poorly and some of which we don't. One is that we have to be able to say and to express and to know what's wrong, right? We have to be able to find the sources and go, this chain of thought is wrong. And the other piece is that we have to say why it's wrong from our own sources, from our own experience, from our own knowledge. We can't just go, that's wrong because I don't believe that, I believe everyone's equal. We have to go, that's wrong because the Tanakh believes everyone's equal because the rabbis said this and not that. And I think that that's ultimately, if we want to be religiously minded Jewish people who are doing anti-racism work, we have to combine both an acknowledgement of what's wrong and the weapons that we have to use against that have to come from our own tradition because otherwise we have no help, no hope of actually responding to it in a way that is going to be heard by the people for whom this is a normal way of thought. So, I mean, I think that's the place to begin. That's not nearly enough, but I think that we have to start at home and we have to start in our own tradition and we have to look at where these issues are and know what the right way is to address them and actually be willing to do so. Thank you. Um, I just wanna add a couple of things to that. Um, I hope that everyone here can agree that racism is evil. Um, I think it is harder for, to get everyone to everyone in general to agree that racism is something that we are constantly being taught and retaught that it's not um, you know, getting your appendix removed when you realize that racism exists in society. It's not, okay, I did that now. I, I, I figured it out and now I'm not racist anymore. That actually it's something that we're constantly, constantly being taught. Um, and if we want to do the work against racism, um, it's really hard to do that from a place in which we are actually you know, grappling with internal racisms that we don't see. And if we want to actually do that work well, I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it, frankly, because I don't know exactly how to do it either. But I know that we're not going to do the work well if we are ourselves falling into these pitfalls of racism. 
that we are, you know, we're sort of stumbling around um, in the dark a lot of the time with this stuff because it's so well ingrained into the society in which we live. Um, one way in which we can be better at it is by recognizing where the pitfalls are to be able to walk around them a little bit. I think that's why this is important. Um, I think in terms of, you know, I was thinking when you were talking, Rabbi Adam, about like, why is this Masorti? And I think this is Masorti because we, we live within the tradition. We live within the society and we're also able to look back at it with a sense of reality um, and sort of deconstruct how we got to the place that we are. I think that is what, we're, what we've been doing in terms of sort of structures of racism within Judaism. And I think that's also what we have to do in terms of moving forward as a society in a less racist way. We have to accept that actually we have to live within it, that our other option is to go off and live in the woods. Um, we have to continue living in the society that's been built, but we also have to be working at rebuilding it at the same time, at deconstructing what went wrong and trying to build it in a way that's both sturdy and, um, and just better than it was. Um, I think that recognizing some of the ways in which we're led into these places is a good starting point. I'm not sure that I know exactly what the good ending point is, but please God, with a lot of with a lot of work and a lot of patience, um, we'll get there one day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Adam and Rabbi Natasha. I think this has been really thought provoking and important and a beginning of a very big conversation, an ongoing conversation that I hope we can have as, as a community going forward. Thank you everybody for participating and for your thoughtful and important questions and comments. Um, just a few associated um, announcements. Um, Rabbi Joel, um, Konefesh Masorti have got two, I mean, as if by chance, two brilliant um, events this afternoon, this evening, actually. Rabbi Joel, do you just want to say a couple of words about them? Because it's, it's, it's the right audience of the people who are here. Um, and I'll share the details as you're speaking. Are you, can you unmute yourself? Oh, no, you can't. Wait, Joel, you're not unmuted. Um, there you go. Okay, so uh, the, that was a really wonderful presentation, but and we kind of jumped from uh, the Bible through to the Zohar, and we skipped out a couple of millennia, as Rabbi Adam said. So what we're, the, the first session that run, we're running this afternoon from six till seven is going to be looking at the history, the textual history of the Kushites, um, working from the Bible through to the beginning of the medieval period through to Maimonides, just a, an hour to look at some kind of key sources on how Kushites are represented in classical Jewish sources before you get to the Zohar. And then later on, uh, it's, uh, I think it's at 7.30, Professor Jonathan Schorsch from Potsdam University, who's an expert on relationships between Jews and black people, is gonna be giving a, a lecture on the relationship between Jews and black people in the early modern period, uh, particularly the period of the slave trade. Maybe seeing how some of these attitudes and ideas that Rabbi Adam and Rabbi Natasha were talking about was actually translated into behavior in the relationships between Jews and black people in the early modern period. And there's uh, the Zoom link is the same. Uh, it's on the, it's, uh, Rachel just shared it. So thank you very much to people who wanna come along. Great, thank you, Rabbi Joel. Um, and one other announcement, or a big date for saving your diaries, February the 28th is going to be our Masorti celebration, our annual Masorti celebration. It's also going to be where our fourth, no, is it our fourth or fifth Masorti Think session is going to happen, which is going to be with Rabbi Oliver Joseph of New North London and the Chavura and Rabbi Danny Newman of Elstree and Boreham Wood Masorti Synagogue and of Edra Masorti Synagogue are going to be discussing issues around poverty and capitalism and the relationship between the two and a Jewish approach to thinking about them. So that is next in our series. And the day is going to be, it's going to be an afternoon of amazing sessions, um, also culminating in our big, it's instead of our annual dinner. So as well as a lot of learning, a bigger fundraising celebration as well. So we really hope everyone will be able to be there and you'll be hearing more about that from us. Um, and I think that's it again. Thank you, everyone. It's really great. It was a great morning and pleased to have you all here. And I hope that everybody will enjoy the snow. 
for the rest of the day. Thank you and uh, Shavuotov. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>